Hello everybody, welcome to another Tool Time Tuesday. Mrs. Koenig here, ready to tell you some more about those pesky commas. If you remember the last week, I taught you some rules, rules number one through six, about how to use commas to make yourself a better writer. Today is part two, and we're going to start with rule number seven. Rule number seven, when you're using commas for direct address, what that means is we use commas to set off the nouns of a direct address or what's called the name of someone directly spoken to. Here's how that looks in a sentence. It's when you insert someone's name either before, in the middle, or after the rest of the sentence you're stating. For example, here's something where it's in between. Explain to us, Mr. Hunter, why you felt the need to sign with the California Angels for more money. In this case, you're taking a pause and you're inserting who you're speaking to. So you need a comma right after explain to us, comma right there. Mr. Hunter is who you're addressing, comma after his name, and then continue with the rest of the sentence. Another example would be where you state the, or you address someone at the end of the sentence. For example, the sentence would read, Good afternoon, Anna. Right after good afternoon, you put a comma because then you're addressing who you're speaking to. It's almost like you're taking that pause and waiting for them to look at you so that they know you're speaking directly to them. A third way you use it is when you address someone right in the, in the beginning of the sentence. For example, John, are you stopping by Jim's house? John, comma, is what's called a direct address. You're speaking to John, you put that pause comma there, it's almost like you metaphorically are waiting for him to turn his head and look at you. So it's kind of saying like, John comma, like you're John, look at me, are you stopping by Jim's house? So that's the first rule is something called direct address. Whenever you're speaking directly to someone, you need to have that pause. And when you're addressing them by name, the name follows or you have the name and then you pause and then you continue with the rest of the sentence. All right, that is rule number seven. Here's rule number eight. I don't know if you guys ever have heard of what's called an interjection, but it's basically an interjecting thought. If you remember, means among, inter means among or in between. Interjection is where you kind of throw a, a thought in the middle of another thought. It's almost like you interject. You stick something in the middle of it or you continue with another thought added on to the original sentence you're, you're saying. I know that sounds hard to, to listen to and to understand, but here's how it would look in a sentence. Yes, I would love to see High School Musical on ice. Well, I wasn't sure whether the note was from him or not, so I threw it away. Whenever you have that what's called an interjecting thought, and then you continue with the rest of the thought, the comma separates that. Yes, comma, I would love to go see High School Musical, or well, comma, I wasn't sure whether when you have what's called an interjectory kind of a phrase or a, or a word, you need to put a comma in there to kind of give that reader or the, the mental pause so the reader has a chance to process what's coming, okay? Rule number nine goes along with rule number eight. It's called introductory words or phrases. Here, it's very similar to rule number eight. You use commas to separate introductory words or phrases from the rest of the sentence. You kind of want to offset it almost like a pause so that people can really wrap their head around what you're saying. And here are some very common introductory words or phrases. Um, some key words that indicate an introductory phrase would be when, while, after, before, if, so, since, if these words begin a sentence, use a comma after the phrase, but ignore them if they're in the middle of the sentence. But when they start off a sentence, it's, it's again, it's going to be a phrase that warms the reader up and then a new thought's going to follow that. It's always easiest just to see it in an in actual sentence. Since hearing the prognosis, I have been a nervous wreck. A prognosis is like a diagnosis from a doctor. So in this case, since is at the beginning of the sentence. So it's kind of like an introductory phrase that the reader, you want the reader to think about, this is when it happened, and then what happened after that. So it's kind of like two different parts of a sentence, but they work together. Since hearing the prognosis, comma, I have been a nervous wreck. So this tells 
how long have you been a nervous wreck? Well, since hearing the prognosis. So you see how the two of them work together to form one sentence, but there needs to be a comma between the two because they're kind of two different thoughts, but yet one is building on the other. So therefore you want to put a comma between them. Another example, after the movie, comma, we went for ice cream. So when did we go for ice cream? Well, after the movie. So do you see how there's two different thoughts, but yet they kind of, they work together to convey a bigger meaning for the reader. This tells when we went for ice cream, and this tells what we did after we went to the movie. So the two of them work together, but you do need a nice comma pause in there so that the reader can digest one uh, phrase and then see where you're building on right after. Another one, unfortunately, comma, the game cannot be rescheduled. So in this case, again, you're introducing an idea like, oh, it's a bummer, but the game can't be rescheduled. In other words, it's, it's, uh, it's letting the reader know that it, you're sad about it. Unfortunately, comma, the game cannot be rescheduled. So introductory words or phrases are very, um, a very common use of the comma. Sorry about that. Okay, rule number 10. It's called the interrupters. These are what are called the parenthetical expressions. Oh, I love par parenthetical. Those are the parentheses. Those are little hugging marks. Um, sometimes when you want to interject a thought and, and you put them in parentheses, it's called a parenthetical or parenthetical information or a parenthetical expression. You want to offset it. It's kind of almost like a side note. Like you put your hand up on the side and you kind of lean and tell a secret to someone. It's like on the side, you're giving a little bit more information for the reader um, besides what you're trying to say in the sentence. So pretend like you're leaning to the side and you're kind of covering your mouth and you're telling a secret to someone. That, that's what I like to think of for what's called a parenthetical expression, where you're trying to tell a secret or you're just adding more information for the reader to, to better understand what you're going to say. Here, here's how that looks. I, on the other hand, love to eat chocolate cookies. On the other hand, you're showing a, a, um, a contrary thought to something that you had said previously. I, comma, on the other hand, comma, love to eat chocolate cookies. Change, comma, I believe, comma, is life's only constant. Here, again, you're leaning in, just saying that you, this is something you believe. Change, lean to the side, tell you a secret, I believe, is life's only constant. And then another one, learning about commas, comma, for example, comma, helps us be become better writers. You're just trying to lean in and let them know that learning about commas, ooh, for example, meaning I'm giving you an example right here about learning for, about commas, makes us a better writer. So I know some of these are really confusing. You might, I, all I want you to do is try to get a few of them, but some of my higher readers and writers, I think you're going to start to be able to um, grapple with this and do this just fine. Okay. So those are our rules for today. Oh, do I have one more? I think I have one more. Oh, I have one more. Yep. Rule number 11. Oh, a positive. I love this word. Rule number 11 with comma uses is something called an appositive. Use commas to set off a positive. And a positive is a noun or a phrase that comes immediately after another noun that gives more information about that noun. It kind of goes with like you're leaning to the side and you're giving like background knowledge, almost like you're telling a little inside secret to the reader. So um, here's how that looks. Sally, my neighbor, sells seashells by the seashore. So my neighbor, you're, you're, you're giving a little bit more information about Sally. You're letting the reader know that she's your neighbor. But you need those commas to pause and offset that. that and the positive is where you're giving more information about the subject. So you want to offset that. If you, if you don't have that, it wouldn't make sense. If you said, Sally, my neighbor sells seashells by the seashore. It doesn't make sense the way you, if you have no commas. But with commas, here's how you say it. Sally, my neighbor sell seashells by the seashore. Here's another one. Emily Fox, a standout guard for the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers, is a world champion cup stacker. Now, if you took out the standoff, standout guard and just said Emily Fox is a world champion cup stacker, that would be correct. However, you're giving some, and a positive in there, you're giving more information about Emily Fox 
Um, besides that she's a champion cup stacker, she's a standout guard for the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers. In other words, she's a basketball player, and she's really good at being a basketball player. But in addition to that being a basketball player, she's a world champion cup stacker. Holy cow. So that you, But you need the comma when you're in inserting that information so it, it groups it so the reader understands what you're saying and it doesn't jumble together in one big massive thought that the reader can't understand what you're talking about because you're talking about golden gophers guards and cup stacking but the commas help you organize that thinking a little bit okay all right so i gave you uh five more rules so we're going to practice again so I want you, as soon as you're done with this video, this uh, video, I want you to visit BB9. I want you to go to the little spot, our regular grammar resources, because you know that you found this in the lesson tab. But I want you to go in the grammar resources this time, and I want you to find the worksheet that says using the comma effectively practice sheet number two. Okay. I want you to download and the practice sheet into Notability. And I want you to work to work, uh, complete the worksheet. You can check back to the presentation anytime if you need to. And then when you're all done with your practice, I want you to upload your completed practice sheet to your Google Drive and then to Google Classroom. So I hope that makes sense. I hope you guys have good time practicing. Again, don't be afraid to come back and check the, the slides that I showed you. It'll be a great help. Um, but really try to give yourself some good practice with using uh, commas in these little bit harder contexts. And um, again, email me with any questions. Um, maybe next time I'll try to do a video with myself a little bit and I'll bop back and forth so you can see me because I sure miss you guys. I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care and thanks for joining me for Tool Time Tuesday.